I, I can't see what I'm doing. My, my monitor's not on here. So I can, I don't know. I can guess, or I can, but the, I think the power's not on and my monitor's down here, so I can't see anything at all. Um. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't you go down to the pad and I'll, I'll crane my neck around while we figure out how to turn on the monitors. Um. Yep, do I see something for a second there? No. Okay, yeah, I think I think you turn the power on from back there. Right. Okay. Great. I'll turn around like you and watch the uh, watch this. Okay. So actually uh, we're at a, a sort of a critical juncture in, in the class. Um, here's actually the good news. Um, so I guess we, we spent a little bit of time looking at things like systems, Laplace transforms, you know, this kind of stuff. Poles and zeros and dynamical interpretations. Uh, did a, a tour of uh, linear time invariant systems, transfer functions, frequency response, all that kind of stuff. And we're right here. And here's the good news. I, I think basically from now on, there's not going to be any new material, uh, any new fundamental material in the class. That's it. You know everything now. In fact, the rest of the class is going to be applications. I, I still don't have the monitor on. Here, I, I just heard something. The sound of uh, monitors turning on. But I'll let you know what. Yes, we have monitors. Okay, great. Or at least one, anyway. Two. Um, okay. Uh, so, in fact, the rest of the course is actually, we're just going to be applying all of these concepts. Block diagrams, differential equations, uh, poles, zeros, um, all these kind of ideas. Frequency response, transfer functions. And we're going to be applying them to actually some really important and interesting applications. So, the... Uh, it's, a very good situ it's a very good situation to be in. This has, has, first of all, it's more interesting because it's not just sort of here's a frequency response and so on and who cares. Um, it'll act, we'll actually look at, at all sorts of stuff that actually works and is based on all this material. Um, the other thing is it allows you to get a better feel for the material we've covered, right? So that's also that's actually critically important is so that for example things like frequency response and DC gain and what does the step response mean is that by the end of this quarter it will really really mean something and you'll in context of examples and things like that so basically for the next um, uh, maybe two and a half weeks or so we're gonna look at maybe three weeks we're gonna look at a, a big area of application called feedback um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk uh, in great deal, a great deal of, about that in the next couple of weeks. But it's an application, and there is, in fact, nothing new here. There's absolutely nothing new. Once you understand the stuff before this, it's just an application. There'll be plenty to say, though, as you'll see. So this is where we are. Um, and we're going to start, in fact, this is non-traditional, but we're going to start with static analysis. Okay, so that means we're going to look at this idea of feedback, which, of course, I haven't even told you what it is yet. But we're going to look at this idea of feedback, and we're going to start with a static analysis, because I think this is not unlike circuits. Once you understand static analysis, right, then it turns out that dynamic analysis, the, the analysis of what happens when everything is dynamic, is, well, it's a of course it's more complicated, but at least this serves as a very good foundation. Same as circuits. You start by understanding static analysis of circuits, and then all of a sudden things are differential equations and everything else. Okay. so. What is feedback? And um, it's used in lots of fields, lots of applications areas. But the basic idea is that a portion of an, out, of an output signal of something is fed back into the input. So here is a standard uh, block diagram that represents um, feedback. Okay, so this, this is it. You've actually seen this block diagram before. You have been forced. You've even done ex homework exercises. You've seen it as examples and so on. Um, so we weren't, I mean, it wasn't an accident that we asked you to look at. It. But now we're actually going to concentrate for actually weeks on just this. You might ask, what on earth can you say for weeks about this thing? And you'll see. It's actually, it, it, it's, it's pretty amazing what you can say about this. OK, so there's a whole bunch of things here. Um, this is sort of a standard form. The truth is that in, uh, when you actually look at a real feedback system, um, they usually don't look this clean. They'll have like extra wires poking all around and things like this. So this is sort of just the simplified conceptual framework. 
And it allows everyone to have, a, if you have a standard like this, it means that the formulas, are, everyone agrees on the formulas and things like that. Then in practice, all those formulas are useless because you have a slightly different block diagram here. But once you understand the basic idea, you can, you can do it. Okay, so here's the idea. U is, uh, is, is an input, that's our block diagram um, standard because it comes from nowhere. So that's an input, U. Um, this, this system here, A, is referred to as the many, many different ways, but you can call it the forward system or the open loop system. Okay? So open loop is supposed to conjure up an image of cutting this wire here. Right? You, you cut the loop and you get just the system A. So A is referred to as the forward system or the open loop system. The output of that is, is, is Y. That's the output of the feedback system. And this output signal goes through another system called F, which of course is kind of a mnemonic for feedback. And that signal comes in and is, sub is subtracted. This minus sign here is actually fairly uh, Im important to notice. The minus sign there is in fact totally irrelevant. Okay. It's there only for, because of a 60-year tradition. That is the only reason it's there. Actually, let's not do that. 70 year tradition. It's a 70 year tradition that minus sign is there. And in fact, what it's going to do is a lot of the formulas we have, because of that minus sign, are going to have pluses in them instead of minuses. You'll, you'll see later what I'm talking about. So um, the minus sign doesn't mean anything. I could just as well write a plus and then redefine f to be like minus f. I could just as well do that. But this is sort of the traditional way. This way, it will be consistent with every book there is, number one, and in fact, going all the way back to 1929. Okay, so for example, the original patents from 1928, 1929 will have, you'll be able to pick up a book from 1931, not that you would, but if you did, and the notation would be fairly consistent. Okay, so there it is, it's a block diagram. Um, oh, this signal E is called the error signal, and the, uh, the assumption there is that whatever this signal is, well, all of it, there, there's already a hint that in fact you want, you want this signal E to be small. <coughs> we'll see later how that works. Okay, so this is, a, this is a feedback system. And it's called a feedback system because it's not, uh, there, there's feedback here. It's not easy, you can't immediately say what Y is in terms of U. What you really have is a set of coupled equations. Those coupled equations are right here. It's Y equals AE and E equals U minus FY. If I want to express Y in terms of U, I have to eliminate E from this equation. Now in some cases, we'll be able to do that. In others, we actually won't be able to. And in fact, in most of the most interesting applications, you actually cannot analytically solve these equations. We'll see that later. Um, we'll still actually be able to talk a great deal about how y depends on u, which is actually kind of interesting. Okay. So this system, uh, the whole feedback system is sometimes called a closed loop system to uh, distinguish it from this open loop system. And here, I mean, this, this, as you'll see in a minute, this is, it's widely used. But the signals here, they can be all sorts of things. They could be analog uh, electrical signals, like voltages in an amplifier. Um, they could be currents in an amplifier. This can be, you can have a mechanical feedback system. That's very common. Um, this, could be, uh, this could be digital electronic implementations. These could be little microprocessors, each of these things. Um, and in fact, you'll find that feedback systems are just sort of ubiquitous. They're everywhere. They're in networks, for example. All networks run this way. Every pager works this way. There are dozens of them in every CD player, every hard disk drive. They're all over the place. But you'll get the idea soon. In which case, this, all these signals can be all sorts of weird things. We'll see, we'll see lots of examples before this is over. OK. So th this part so far is just kind of the, the cultural background and letting you know, like, why anyone would be interested in this. So we'll, we'll, quickly get to, uh, we'll quickly get to analysis of it. But this is just so you know where this stuff comes up. OK, so it's very widely used in amplifiers. In fact, it's absolutely critical in amplifiers. It was first widely used in amplifiers uh, in the 20s with vacuum tube amplifiers. In fact, it's not an exaggeration to say that, modern, that radio and telephony would have been absolutely impossible without feedback. We'll, we're going to see why soon. Actually, the fact is you've already seen hints. You've already done analyses here with the feedback system and found that it could be remarkably insensitive to changes in A. So that's, that's actually precisely what enabled uh, all of basically radio, electronic, basically electronics. So electronics wouldn't be possible without this. That is still the case. 
Okay, absolutely still the case that when you design without feedback built into a lot of electronic systems, almost all electronic systems, it, not, not one bit of it would work. Okay, we'll see why soon. It's also the basic idea in a huge field called automatic control. An automatic control, um, the basic idea there is that um, you measure some things. That's, uh, that's over here. That's here. And you feed it back uh, to try to uh, keep, keep something constant or regulate it. And a perfect example would be a, uh, in a CD player, um, the platter is rotating. And the head, the, the head it, has to, it has to actually change speed. The, head, the, the dots are supposed to come off at a fixed rate. And there's a feedback controller that measures that rate and adjust the motor to make sure it's dead on, which it is. Okay, so that's an example. Uh, and we're gonna talk about that in great detail later. later. It's also hu widely used in communications. So, and that's both at the physical layer and at higher levels in a network. Okay, it's used at the, at the physical layer, a layer. It's everything basing oscillators. Phase lock loop is something we'll, we'll even hopefully talk about if we have time. And it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere, okay? Um, it also occurs at higher la layers, feedback. So for example, sophisticated uh, cell phone systems, which are critically dependent on precise timing of signals. All the signals are synchronized by feedback because what happens is when your phone is listening to a little slot in a TDMA system, what it does is it listens for a little slot and it actually listens on a, over a little wider window and it decides internally whether, whether it was a little bit late or a little bit early and it uses feedback to adjust itself. Okay, so basically it's everywhere. Now when a feedback system is properly designed, here, here are the types of benefits you get from it. Um, far less sensitive to component variation. In fact, in, and this can be, it's, it's stunning, absolutely stunning. We'll see examples of that really soon. Um, it can also be less sensitive to uh, interferences and noises. We'll talk about that. Um, it's extremely important in many cases that what feedback can do is make things more linear and also make them faster. And this is compared to uh, open loop, uh, similar open loop systems. We're gonna talk about all these things. Um, now there's also some disadvantages. For example, uh, often it's used, usually when it's used, when you get all these advantages, you, you usually pay for it in terms of smaller gain. Um, and in fact, this, this is what makes everything really interesting. There's the possibility of instability. So in other words, you might say that the dynamics, if you're not careful, the dynamics can be much worse, okay? So we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about the advantages here, are we implicitly assuming that this is negative feedback? Oh, uh, you know, we're going to talk about negative and positive feedback later. Um, the truth is that, that, that actually it's, an Ill po it's, it's, it's not even a well-defined <coughs> concept, negative and positive feedback. So we're going to talk about that at several points here. But you will, uh, it, it, it's not a, it's not a well-defined concept. Although, in fact, it does kind of mean something. Yeah, so, and in fact, the best definition, which is not the one you'll actually find, in books you'll actually find people talking about negative and positive feedback, is actually really stupid, the discussion, for reasons that will become clear. Okay. The, probably the best way to say it is that there's actually, there's, the truth about feedback is that basically you're allowed to trade off these things with these. In 99% of the applications, what you do is you want more of these things. You want these things, and you're willing to pay for it with these. There are a handful of applications where it's the other way around. And you're willing to actually make the system more sensitive to component variation, more sensitive to interference and noises, less linear, and slower in return for more gain. Okay, so we'll, we'll see. And then, then it makes sense to talk about negative and positive feedback. But we're gonna come back to that many, many times, the idea of, of negative and positive feedback. No, so we simply define this to be a feedback, a feedback system. And right now, let's leave um, what negative and positive feedback as undefined terms. Okay. So it turns out, uh, I mean, often feedback in applications, they don't draw this picture. Okay. Here is a perfect example. Um, here is, uh, here's, a, here's a feedback system. Okay. And one, you know, once you've taken uh, 113, 214, all these things, you'll instantly realize this is a, this is a feedback system. Um, but the connection between this and the block diagram I wrote, I presume at this point is not clear. I mean, I, I, I hope it's not clear, or you'd have to be awfully good to realize that this is a feedback system. Um, let me just briefly say how, 
how this is a feedback system. Although, in fact, in the future, you'll instantly look down at this resistor and, and you'll know it's feedback. Um, let me tell you the reason why. The, outputs, the output is, is the voltage across this resistor. Oh, but that's proportional to the current, the drain current, which is the same as the, as the source current. Well, that means that every time a voltage appears here, it, uh, a proportional voltage appears here. Hey, but wait a minute. The drain current here is a function of the, of, of the voltage between the gate and the source. In fact, it's, it's the gate voltage minus that. Guess what I, just, what I just explained was I could write down the equations for feedback. This is a feedback system. And you can even identify the blocks and things like that if you want. We're going to look at this more carefully later, so don't worry if you didn't get the details. But that's a feedback system. OK. You see other configurations. This is a configuration very commonly used in automatic control systems. And here, P is a, is a traditional. That's a, that's a traditional term. It means the plant or the, the term. Uh, C is a controller or a compensator is a traditional term for, uh, for, for this. Okay? And it's slightly different. It, you know, it's kind of the same. Yeah, it's kind of the same feel as that. Uh, this is the one you would traditionally see in, for example, electronics. And this is the type of C you would thing you'd traditionally see in automatic control. Um, once you understand one, you're OK. As long as you don't think that the same formulas hold for the other, you're fine. But once you get the hang of it, you'll realize that they're very different. So for right now, we're going to simply stick for this entire lecture with just this. We won't talk about circuits yet. And we won't do this. We will get to that. Um, but we're just going to stick with this. And the reason is then you have just one set of formulas. And whenever I say something, I mean, the open loop system, it means that. And whenever I say closed loop system, it means that. OK. So we'll start with the simplest case, static linear case, which the truth is you've already done. I think we forced you to do it anyway on a homework problem. So in the static linear case, uh, these become uh, gains. Uh, they're simply, these are just real numbers, alpha, a, a and f. OK? Here, I mean, this is stupid. You just solve the equations here. This is, uh, I mean, here, you just write, write A equals A times E. E is U minus Fy. You get this equation. Now I put, these are numbers, remember, not systems. So, I mean, this is the same as AU minus AFY. I put this minus AFY on the other side. I get 1 plus AFY equals AU. And now I divide by 1 plus AF. And what I get is this. I get Y is GU. Where G, which is just a gain, is A over 1 plus AF. That's called the closed loop system gain here. So the open loop gain, which occurs when F equals 0. And in fact, this is a very nice test to make sure you got it right. When F is 0, this simplifies to A. That's the feed forward system. Okay? Just to check to make sure that your formula is right. This is the closed loop system gain. And there's a bunch of terms here. AF is referred to as the loop gain. That is the, that is the gain sort of from E here through the loop up to here. Doesn't count the minus sign. Okay? So it's, it's AF. It's the product of the forward and the feedback gain. It's called the loop gain. That's quite, quite traditional. Um, and that's, that's the idea. Now, the ob now we make a, a really interesting observation here. If AF, if AF is a very large number, then the first thing you can say well, some very interesting things you can say. The first is if A is a huge number here, then AF, oh, and presumably F is a moderate number, then AF is way bigger than 1. Well, sorry, if the loop gain is really big, if AF is really big, then AF, this thing basically becomes, it's about equal to A over AF, which is, in fact, 1 over F. OK? That, that, that occurs if this number is really big compared to 1. OK? This is obvious. Now, the interesting part is that this is true whether A is negative or positive, OK? So what that says is so far, I mean, it's, so what it says right now is that if you wanted to distinguish between uh, you know, positive and negative values of A, it's, so far it has made no difference. We'll see later it's going to make a dramatic difference, right? But for right now, it, it's, uh, it doesn't make any difference at all, right? Positive, negative, doesn't make any difference. So it's about 1 over F. And not only that, uh, it's almost independent of A. In other words, um, one over a over 1 plus AF, provided AF is really big, it's 1 over F, which doesn't have anything to do with A. Um, you've, already, you've already kind of observed that, right? Um, so, and, and quick studies will show that this is the case. For example, you know, we can work out various examples here. If you take F equals 1 here, and you take A equals 100, 
then G is, uh, is A, so we take A equals 100, F equals 1, right? Then I have 100 over 101, so the gain is 0.99, right? If I then make A 1,000, right, then what I get is 1,000 over 1,001. That's 0.999, okay? So now, and I think you'd had a homework problem on this. What, what's happened here is this, this, this component, this, this system here, A, has changed gain by a factor of 10. That's 20 decibels. And the, but the gain from here to here has changed from 0.99 to 0.999, which is to say, for all practical purposes, it hasn't changed at all. Okay? So that's, that's, that's the basic. And it really comes down to l l stuff that is this simple, this l the most elementary algebra. Basically says that A over 1 plus AF, if AF is big, is about equal to 1 over F, number 1. Number two, it's approximately independent of A. OK. So we can actually ask a question like, well, how big is G to 1 over F? So you can take 1 over F minus G divided by 1 over F. This will give you the fractional change um, in, in the fractional difference between G and 1 over F. And what happens when you work out the arithmetic is you get, or algebra, you get 1 over 1 plus AF. That's what you get. Um, we could, I mean, it's, it's not that hard to, to, to work this out. Okay, and now you see immediately what what's going on here. Um, oh, so this has a name: one over one plus AF, which is one over one plus L. That's called the sensitivity, and it's going to keep coming up over and over again, which is why it has a name and therefore should be entered in your symbol table, right? It's, gonna, it's just going to come up a lot of times. Okay, um, and what this says is that in a feedback system, the, if someone shows you this, you should first ask, is loop gain big? And if they say, yeah, then without anything else, you should say, OK, basically, y is, y is um, 1 over f times u. That's what it is. Okay. Or some people say when the loop gain is big, the feedback system inverts the feedback. That's, a, that's, a very, that's another way that people would say. You, you sort of hear this on the streets. That's, what he, that's, what, that's the kind of thing people would say. They'd say, when a, when a feedback system is big, the system basically inverts the feedback. And that's, that's it. So in here, it's, it's, here it's a constant, so it becomes 1 over f. OK. Um, this says, for example, if you have about 20 decibels of loop gain, g is about 1 over, uh, 1 over f within about 10%, because you know, 1 over you know, 10 plus 1 is, is an 11th. For 40 decibels gain, loop gain, you get g is about 1 over f within 1%, and so on. Okay, And in fact, this already shows you that you can have stunning uh, sensitivity reduction here. Stunning. Because what's happening is that um, as, well, as, as A is changing, it's changing the loop gain. Provided that loop gain stays above about 20 dB, the effect on the closed loop gain is, is limited to a little 10% range. That's 1 dB. Right? So that's kind of the, the idea here. So here's an example. This is a feedback amplifier, very important part. It's the basis of essentially all analog electronics. Um, or rather, it's a very critical part of all analog electronics. Yeah. OK, here it is, feedback amplifier. I have a, voltage, I have a little voltage amplifier here, like this. Um, so I have an input voltage here. I take this input voltage. And I, there's no current flows in this input terminal. This is a simple case. And then over here, I have a, a dependent voltage source. I put a voltage source here, which is uh, a gain A times this input voltage. And then I ground one side of that. And the, this comes out as V out. And then I go through a resistor network, R2 and R1, like this. And the point is that this circuit actually implements, it's, it's a feedback loop. And let's see, let's see why, how it's a standard feedback system. Well, first we write V out is A, V. That simply describes this, OK? But what's V? V is the difference in voltage between this voltage and that voltage. This voltage is V in. That's V in. This voltage here, by voltage divider rule, is R1 over R1 plus R2. And so I get this. So it's the difference between V in and that. Now, if you study these equations, and then you look at these equations here, let me put them both there, these equations and these equations, you will find out that they are absolutely identical. Y is V out. E is V, OK? Um, F is 
is this thing, R1 over R1 plus R2. Okay? So that's the idea. It all works. Okay? Now, of course, we could analyze this. We don't need all this fancy 1 over 1 plus AF. But at least now you, now you know something about an amplifier, this amplifier circuit. Um, if the loop gain, which is A times R1 over R1 plus R2 is big, say bigger than 10, then this thing here will have a gain, which is approximately equal to 1 plus R2 over R1. That's 1 over, the, that's one over F. Um, within 10%. And then A can vary by orders of magnitude. And the gain of this thing will still be this. And I think you probably saw this in 101, or I don't know, you probably saw hints, hints of this in, in, in 101. Um, so here, for example, if F is 0.1, right? That, so for example, if I have a 1K and a 9K resistor, like that, as my feedback network, then basically your gain is 10, your closed loop gain is 10. Within 10% if A is bigger than 100. If A is bigger than 1,000, then it's within 1%. Um, and for example, as A varies from, 10, from 100 to 1,000, that's 20 decibels variation. Right? It's a factor of 10 variation. The closed loop gain varies about 10%. Okay? So the idea here is that large variations in open loop gain lead to much smaller, very much dramatically smaller. Right? A, a, 10, a 10 to 1 increase here changes a 10 to, 10 to 1 variation in a parameter turns out to lead to uh, a basically a 10% variation. Now let me explain the practical importance of this. The practical importance of this, this came up in, in the 1920s. They were first making um, vacuum tube amplifiers. You can laugh or snicker or something if you want, but the fact is we're in the same situation now 70 years later except it's transistors. So it turns out all the ideas worked out then have saved basically have saved us many, many times. But so here it was. It's the 20s. They were building, uh, they were building vacuum tubes, which were the basic. That, the point about a vacuum tube is it's basically it's a transconductance device. So if I put a load resistor here, it's basically exactly this thing. Well, they were just, they were, it was all very new. They were just fiddling around. They didn't quite understand how they all worked, and they, they didn't have very good manufacturing facilities. And several phenomena uh, turned out to be a real problem. Number one is any fixed vacuum tube had a gain that often varied by a factor of like 4 to 1. That's a huge range. In other words, when you first turn it on, you might have a gain of 50. Later that afternoon, the gain might drop to 30. Okay. Worse than that, if you, go to the, if, you go to the end of, if you go to the back end of the manufacturing line and you pull off two tubes with the same, with the same number on it and you test both, the gains will vary. Uh, over consider like 3 to 1. Now, just imagine trying to engineer a system where individual components vary by a factor of 3 to 1. I mean, try to imagine building a bridge where the strength of the steel, and someone says, well, uh, say, what's the maximum load? You could, what's the maximum tension you can put on that steel? And they're like, I don't know. Depends. Monday, Tuesday. <laughs> Depends who made the steel, right? I mean, ima you know, anyway, the point is, you know, you don't get very far doing that unless you're very clever, okay? So, the solu so basically, you couldn't build it. You couldn't build a repeater amplifier for telephony. You couldn't build a radio if, if some components in your, in your toolbox of parts, and in fact, these are the critical ones. They're the only things that do amplification, right? Um, if the most critical component you have is quite unreliable and variable, you got to be smart about what you're doing. And so this is the trick. This is just this is the feedback amplifier. This is the trick. So the idea, in fact, there are wonderful quotes from 1929 about, about this, where they, they talk about uh, you, del you deliberately make an amplifier with way too much gain. Then they said, by cleverly using feedback around it, you reduce the gain, and you end up with an amplifier which, it, which exhibits, I mean, I'm even, I'll bring this quote in. It's really good. It says, uh, uh, it says things like, uh, it said, it said it's, 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 we found in practice that extraordinary constancy of amplification becomes possible. So, and it says that, that this, is, this is maintained over the life of the vacuum tube and so on and so forth. So, all right, so 70 years later, active devices are now transistors or uh, usually MOS. They're MOS, MOS devices. These are our, okay. So um, how reliable are they? Can we manufacture them better? Well, sure. It's not, you know, we can manufacture them better. Do they vary? Oh, yeah, a hell of a lot. They, they vary like crazy. So in other words, if you, you build MOS devices, right, then they vary. 
They vary with temperature. Uh, they vary in manufacture. They vary across, right on the same chip, they vary. They don't vary over factors of 5 to 1, that's true. Okay? But the point is, if you, have a, if you have a big complicated thing with 50 transistors, and all of them are plus minus 30 percent, you know, you try to design something that actually works and is reliable. You can't do it. So in fact, feedback is, crit is absolutely critical there as well. So that's the idea of the feedback amplifier. Um, it's really difficult to underemphasize the impact, the practical Im impact this has had. And, and to first order, the practical impact is totally understandable using high school algebra. It's basically the fact that A over 1 plus AF is approximately 1 over F, provided AF is big. That's it. So that enabled all sorts of fields. OK, so this is a, as an example. And in this example here, uh, anyway, you, you get the idea. Okay, and it's widely used now. It's why, in fact, it's even, it's even changed the, the way people even design. They even just, they talk about op amps. What's an op amp? Well, you know from 101. But in fact, the truth is, I'll tell you what an op amp is. An op amp is an amplifier which has a lot of gain, right? But quite variable. It may vary with temperature. It may vary with manufacture. It may vary with time. That's what an op amp is. It's now just part of the common vocabulary. It's a standard part. No one uses, you usually do not use, almost always, you do not use an op amp without feedback. OK? OK. So we can also look at the sensitivity to small changes in A. Um, so here, for example, let's write down that uh, here's G. G is A over 1 plus AF, like that. And I can look at partial G partial A. That tells me that the partial derivative, it's the local sensitivity of the closed loop gain with respect to the, to the feed forward or amplifier gain, right? So now the problem, OK, so we can work that out. It's partial partial A of this thing, and you get this expression. 1 over 1 plus AF squared. Notice that that's our sensitivity squared again, OK? Now, um, what this says is that if you had a small change in your amplifier gain, sorry, in your feed forward or your uh, forward gain, that the change in the closed loop gain would be about equal to 1 over 1 plus AF squared times delta A. Now, this is an interesting formula, but it's actually far more interesting to, to, to express it in terms of relative changes. And so the way you do that is you say, actually, if I tell you, for example, if I tell you that the closed loop gain changes by 0.01, the, the question is, is that big or small, right? If the closed loop gain is 10, that's incredibly small. If the closed loop gain is 0.01, that's 100% change, and it's a big deal. So the correct way to do this is to use relative or fractional gain changes. So you look at delta G over G, and you get this. And then what you do is, in fact, you also express the change in the open loop gain in terms of a, uh, a fractional change. And you get this. You get delta G over G is about delta A over A times S. That's our famous thing, the sensitivity. So there you go. Okay. And this formula then, or sorry, this formula then, people usually write out this way. It says that the sensitivity, which is 1 over 1 plus AF for a feedback system, is about equal to the fractional change in closed loop gain divided by the fractional change in open loop gain. And that's assuming that these are both small. Okay? And the squiggles here mean that this is not exactly equal, it's predicted on the basis of a first order Taylor approximation. That's, it's a partial derivative. Okay? So th that's why this is called the sen it should really be called sensitivity ratio of the system or something like that, because it's a ratio. Okay. Um, now, what this says is, uh, is the following. It says that if the loop gain is large, either positive or negative, makes not the slightest bit of difference, then S here is uh, it, it abs absolute value is much less than 1. And that says that small fractional changes in A yield much smaller fractional changes in G. And what that says is that feedback has reduced the sensitivity of the gain with respect to changes in A. And in fact, the trade-off now is very clear. The open loop gain was A, and the closed loop gain is A over 1 plus AF, which is in fact SA. Okay? So what's actually happened by applying feedback is the gain was reduced from A to SA. It was reduced precisely by the sensitivity. But so was the, sensi so was the sensitivity to fractional changes in A. So that was the trade-off. You lost gain, 
and you gained in sensitivity. Uh, sorry, gained in, I guess people would now call this robustness, which is to say it's the inverse of, of sensitivity to small changes in things. So this we can even uh, express in terms of decibels, right? If you have a small relative change, that can be expressed directly in decibels. So for example, if you take a change in 20 log 10 of x, let's see what that works out to be. This is, the, this is the, a change in x in decibels. Well, you just work out the derivative of this. It's 20 over log 10 um, delta log x. And then you work out what this is. These are log base e. And you work out what that is. It's a constant times delta x over x. So when someone comes up to you and talks about a fractional change, you can actually express that directly in decibels. That's obvious, right? Because it's, it's, it, it makes perfect sense. If someone says that some, it, something is 10%, has increased 10%, another person would say, yeah, it's up plus 1 dB. If something is down 5%, it's minus 0.05 dB, that kind of thing. So this is clear that these are related. And so what this says is the following. Assuming small changes in open loop gain, then the decibels change in the closed loop gain divided by the decibel change in the open loop gain is the sensitivity. Um, for example, if you have a plus minus 2 decibel variation in the forward gain, right, with a loop gain of around 10, that gives you plus minus 0.2 dB variation in G. Okay? So that's, that's how it works. Right? So, um, and so that's, that's the idea. Now it also gives you, it also tells you that G is about 20 decibels, sorry, 20 decibels smaller than A. So as a summary of, of, of all of these things, which is just talking about this, it's just algebra. The summary is that, that if the loop gain absolute value is, is big, much bigger than 1, then the gain is reduced by about L. I mean, you can also write the precise, exp the precise expression is it's reduced by, you know, it's multiplied by that, okay? And the sensitivity of the gain with respect to A is reduced also by about L. In fact, that's also reduced precisely by this amount, okay? And that says that feedback allows you to trade gain for reduced sensitivity. So for example, I could do this. Suppose I, ha I, I build, I can manufacture an amplifier out of vacuum tubes or MOS transistors. It doesn't make any difference. I manufacture an amplifier, and I can control my manufacturing as carefully as I, as I, I can. And no matter what, the amplifiers that pop off the end of the production line vary by about plus minus two decibels. That's not a whole lot. In fact, what is, uh, four, well, four decibels is the whole range. That's that's what, what, num what fraction is four decibels? What's four decibels? About. What's three? Three is 1.4, right? Square root of two or something like that. So that's eh, one and a half. That's, that's a 60% variation. That's a lot, right? And I can control it all I like, but maybe with temperature or something like that, it changes. Or it depends on whose wafer I'm building this on or whose fab is, is running these parts for me. And it just, I can't do it any better. Okay, if I want to, I can use feedback to reduce the gain by 10 decibels, okay? If I reduce it by 10 decibels, right, then what happens is that reduction in decibels, turn, it, it, it multiplies this thing, okay? So let's see, oh sorry, this is not 10 decibels. I have 30, I go to 20, so my reduction in, my reduction in gain is a factor of three, uh, of three halves, right? So the same thing happens here. The plus minus 2, B, 2 dB is actually also multipli uh, multiplied by 2 thirds. It's reduced by that. And 2 thirds of that is, I guess, about that. Let me make sure that's right. Is that about right? Seems reasonable. Yeah, it's close. OK. Or I can trade 20 decibels of gain for an amplifier that's 10 decibels plus minus 0 0.2. That's the whole, that's in fact the, the trick here. That's the trick to all of this. It made all sorts of stuff possible. It says, what you do is you ask in a certain application, how much, how much variation can you tolerate here? Then you simply, and then you say how uncertain are your components? And you simply build in enough extra gain that when you apply feedback, you'll be within your spec. Within your spec in terms of both gain and sensitive and, and variation. So that's the idea. So as I've already said, this is completely critical in things like vacuum tube amplifiers. It's also still completely critical in all, uh, in all integrated circuit analog electronics. Totally critical. Um, let's see. You, um, you get the benefits of feedback um, if AF is big. And that means either big 
or very small negative. Same thing, right? One over, if L is, is minus 10,000, the sensitivity here is still a very small number. The sign is switched, okay? But you still get the benefits of it. Um, now, the sensitivity with respect to F, that's your feedback system, is not small. So in other words, you need accurate, reliable feedback components. And that's something I should, I'll, I'll say something about. Um, and let me say something about that. Um, it turns out, I guess not on this one, but on the next one when you start working on this stuff, you'll find out that the sensitivity uh, with respect to the feedback gain is actually uh, enhanced. It's amplified often, okay, which is kind of interesting. Then you think, well, this is, this is kind of a zero-sum game. Well, it turns out if you think about it in any actual application, it's not. Uh, let's go back to 1929. You have a vacuum tube. And then the feedback is implemented with two resistors. Okay. So then you start asking the question, well, how reliable are the resistors? Well, it turned out they could make resistors quite reliable then. In other words, easily they could achieve resistors that when you get a whole bunch off a manufacturing line and you put an ohmmeter on them, they're all plus minus 1%. They can do better, they could do even better than that. And today they can do much better. In fact, on an integrated circuit now, it's not the resistances that can, can, can be controlled very well, it's the ratio of resistances. And in fact, if you go back and look what F is, F is a ratio of resistances. Okay, that can be very sharply controlled now. So actually then, there is a net benefit, right? Because when you apply feedback, I mean, the goal, I mean, if, if you don't know, F, if, if, if all of the parts you're gonna build something from suck, basically, then it's gonna be hard to actually put something together and make it work a whole lot better. Although you can, there's ways you can do that. So here, the important part is that there are some parts which are unreliable and uncertain and others which are quite reliable and quite certain. And so if you make an arrangement of these parts where the sensitivity with respect to the kind of the uncertain parts is, is reduced, even if the sensitivity to the, better, to, the, to the other parts is enhanced, you still win. That's sort of the idea. I don't know if any of this makes sense, but that's the idea. Now, the opposite is true. Uh, in a very small number of cases, people actually use feedback the other way around. And this is sort of, this is when some people talk about positive and negative feedback. This is kind of the idea. So it's also possible to go back and we've studied, well, we've studied just something, this, 1 over 1 plus AF. Just that little formula, okay? It's, we've studied it in the case when AF is really big and we've noted all sorts of facts about it. Now, there's another interesting value for AF, very interesting value, and that's when AF is nearly minus 1. When AF is nearly minus 1, what can you say about A over 1 plus AF? It's really big, exactly. That's fascinating, okay? That says that, oh, by the way, also, when 1 over 1 plus AF is, is, is nearly 0, that's the sensitivity. That says that in such a, for example, if I arrange for AF to be about minus 0.9, then the, the closed loop gain is 10 times bigger right, than the open loop gain, okay? It's a fact, and this is done, this was, this was also widely used in the 20. It's called regenerative feedback. There they did it because it's at, at high frequencies for a lot of the radio applications, early radar, they just couldn't get the gain. It just wasn't there. So they actually used, po this is what they would call positive or regenerative feedback to actually boost the gain, and so this is what was done. Now, that came at a price. And the nice part was you actually now tune in a radio station that you could not possibly have done before. And here's the bad news. The bad news is that the sensitivity with respect to gain has also now gone up by a factor of 10. And that says that when your amplifier vacuum tube changes 1 dB, your closed loop gain changes 10, okay? So in fact, and in fact, if you found people who uh, fiddled with, you know, who operated radios in the late 20s, that's exactly what they'll say. The, the whole point there is, you know, you have to be careful with this. Oh, the other option, there's another little minor detail there. If it changes in such a way that AF becomes minus one, then we have a little bit of a problem here. And according to the, st the static result, the static analysis doesn't tell you what really happens, but I think you can probably guess what really happens is the whole thing goes unstable, okay? So uh, these were known as, uh, this, this is the use of positive feedback to enhance gain. They had all sorts of names for these things. Uh, regenerative feedback receivers and a slew of patents in the 30s. They were widely used. 
And they were, as you might imagine, quite tricky, right? They would often just burst into oscillation um, for no apparent reason. The whole, thing, the whole thing would just fade, and you'd have to go and you tune your and grab some dial and change F and all that kind of stuff. So I mention this just because um, this, is, this is another use of, of feedback, is actually just to get more, more gain. OK. Um, so we'll look at the next. Um, Making it a little bit more complicated, we'll look at this, uh, this, this business of nonlinear static feedback. So what you've just seen is one of the, if you look back, you'll see that there are a number of things that feedback affects. What we've just seen is its sensitivity with respect to component variation. And we've, we've just discussed that in the static case. Now we're going to see its effect on linearity, which is also stunning and fundamental, fundamentally important to whole fields, uh, especially now. Um, Nonlinear static feedback. What we're going to do now is we're going to assume that A is actually static and nonlinear, meaning it's a function. So for example, you might have a picture that looks like this. Here's E and here's Y. Okay? Incidentally, for those of you who've seen amplifi you know, actually seen some details of amplifier design, this right here is precisely it, it's, an amp it's a common amplifier stage. This is it. You're looking at it. You will see this. You'll see it in 113. Okay, this is, a, this is a common amplifier stage. And it behaves just like you think. I mean, basically it says that if the input is zero, you get zero out. And if you have small inputs here, inputs say on the order of plus minus 0 0.05, then over that range, you know, it looks pretty linear. And you might describe it with some, ac you know, with plus minus a few percent as just a gain. But if, uh, if the gain, if you, if you run the input signal much bigger, this thing starts uh, saturating. And it's nonlinear, like that. Okay, so that's the that's the idea. So this is extremely common uh, for it, it's in fact I, it's actually universal. It's not it's not common. It's universal, okay, and for amplifiers, transducers to be a little bit nonlinear, or like that. Okay, so um, what ha so people call this thing a the nonlinear transfer characteristic of the forward system. Although some people call it the nonlinear transfer function, and this drives me insane. So don't ever say that unless you're going to be very clear. This transfer function means s plus 5 divided by s squared plus 5s plus 3. Okay. okay. This is a transfer characteristic. But you'll actually find, depending on the field, this. And it's okay as long as you don't confuse the two. I guess it's okay. And we're going to make the feedback system linear for now. And what this means is that our system looks like that. That's a representation of it. Now, we have coupled nonlinear equations. Y is A of E and E equals U minus Fy. And of course, when you have nonlinear coupled equations, lots of things can happen. For example, there could be multiple solutions of these equations. Right? For a given U, there could be several values of E that satisfy these equations. There could be no solutions. That's a possibility. In other words, for you could have a certain value of U, and there's no solution of these equations. Now, these things should not scare you. Uh, you've already seen these in 101, these situations. And usually, they, they, they come down to some uh, stupidity in the modeling. Um, and let me give you an example. Um, I don't know. Here's a simple example from 101. Here's a circuit. It's an interconnection of two little two bits and pieces. And what's the solution of this circuit? I mean, let's write down KVL, KCL. And what's the solution of this circuit? Well, what is it? What's the solution? Can you tell me the current? Or what's the voltage across here, for example? What is it? The correct answer here is there is no solution. If you write down KVL, KCL, and the branch equations, you'll have a bunch of equations. And you will quickly discover, by logical manipulation of these equations, an amazing fact, like, for example, 1 equals 0. Okay. And the conclusion will be that this has no solution. Has no solution, right? OK, now I can also do this. I can write one volt here. And now I can ask, does this have a solution? What's the, what is the solution of this circuit? What's the answer there? Does it have any solution at all? Yeah. Here's one. A volt across here and no current flowing. Are there any others? There's lots. I can say, here's another solution. Ready? A volt across here 
and seven amps flowing left to right. All right, you can check, it works. It does, that doesn't violate anything. I mean, a, a voltage source, ideal voltage source, you're not saying what the current is. You just, you fix the voltage, not the current. This is perfectly okay. So the point is that this idea that a, a circuit would have, or a system would have either no solutions or multiple solutions, you've seen it before, and it's usually some pathology like this. Okay. Um, so if you can solve for Y in terms of U, you get something called the closed loop transfer characteristic. And I'll just show you this, and then next time we'll look at how this works. Here's the example here. Is, here is this open loop characteristic. And here's the closed loop characteristic. Okay? That's with a gain of 0.2. Okay? And later we'll see how to do that. By the way, there's no formula of any kind for this. No, anal you can mess around all you like. There is no formula for this curve. Okay? But the, actually, the only thing I want you to look at is to notice something. The main characteristic of that curve is that it is much more linear than that one. And in fact, I had to back way off on the feedback here so that you would even see that this was nonlinear. Okay, so with 20 decibels of feedback gain, this thing just looks like a straight line to the eye. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll continue this, this stuff uh, on Friday. <laughs>